So we've been thinking together about the leper that came to Jesus. Uh, we know there were many lepers healed, but actually there are only two um, recordings of healings of lepers in the scriptures or in the New Testament. Uh, the man that we've been thinking about and then the ten lepers on another occasion. And uh, so tonight we want to go back to Leviticus again. Leviticus uh, chapter 14. Leviticus uh, chapter 14. And um, the book of Leviticus records the, the ceremonial law. It records the things um, practically and visibly which would show that God's people were a holy people and a separate people. And if they came into contact with certain uh, physical things, uh, if they ate the wrong kind of food, those things were to remind them, and when they happened, they reminded them of their need of cleansing in the heart. And this ceremonial law is separate from the moral law, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments continue today. Um, they were written on the human heart at creation. The ceremonial law came in after the fall, after the entrance of sin. And so it's good to remember that reason for the ceremonial law and its purpose. So its purpose was to show the people and to teach the people to be separate and holy unto the Lord. And when they failed to do that, there was provision made for them uh, to be cleansed before and by the Lord. And again, that cleansing involved outward actions. Okay, let's turn then to page 110. Leviticus uh, chapter 14, and we want to read uh, at verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest. So what's happened before this, as we saw, is he's come to the priest, with some sort of skin disease. The priest has looked at it, examined it. He said, yes, that is leprosy, or no, I can't be sure. We're going to give it a week. And then um, uh, later he would, uh, if the leper, um, if the skin disease cleared up, the leprosy cleaned, cleared up, then this is what he had to do. So he shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then if the case of leprous disease is healed in the leprous man or woman, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip, the, dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. <clears throat> and he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, and shave off all his hair, and bathe himself in water, and he shall be clean. And after that he may come into the camp, but shall live outside his tent for seven days. And on the seventh day he shall shave off all his hair from his head, his beard and his eyebrows, he shall shave off all his hair, and then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and he shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall take two male lambs 
without blemish, and one ewe lamb a year old without blemish, and a grain offering of three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil and one log of oil. We're in Leviticus 14 and now at verse 11. And the priest who cleanses him shall set the man who is to be cleansed and these things before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it for a guilt offering along with a log of oil and weigh them for a wave offering before the Lord. And he shall kill the lamb in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the place of the sanctuary. For the guilt offering, like the sin offering, belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Then the priest shall take some of the log of oil, and pour it into the palm of his own left hand, and dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand, and sprinkle some oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And some of the oil that remains in his hand, the priest shall put on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and in the thumb of his right hand, and in the big toe of his right foot, on top of the blood of the guilt offering. And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. Then the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. The priest shall offer the sin offering to make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. And afterwards he shall kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be clean. Amen. And if um, you for a moment were thinking that we were making too much out of the connection between leprosy and sin, you see there how um, the, the Lord, in giving these regulations to, uh, through Moses, makes a very definite connection between leprosy, which was considered an unclean disease, uh, and then the need for inward, uh, uh, inward cleansing. And you see how thorough this cleansing was as well, how precise it had to be, and how then there was, it signified, as we would say, cleansing from head to toe, from head to toe. So let's turn to page 1009 uh, in the Church Bible, and we are coming for the last time uh, to this passage um, of Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, and from verse uh, 40 uh, through to 45. Mark chapter 1, page 1009. So we have thought together about uh, the leper. Uh, what he said to Jesus when he first came before him. We have seen that Jesus was indeed willing and did in fact make uh, the leper clean. And then we saw this morning uh, how in doing so and in taking our sin upon himself, uh, Jesus is not made a, a sinner uh, in uh, his person. Uh, he is not contaminated by taking our sin to himself. And how wonderful that is, because had he been contaminated by our sin, he could not represent us before God, and we would be without a saviour and without a mediator. And equally, we saw this morning the compassion of Jesus, that he's touched by our infirmities, by the, the suffering in our bodies, the suffering in our souls, what uh, our forefathers called the misery 
that flows from sin. The devil promised Adam and Eve there will be enrichment uh, from um, eating of the tree and enrichment if they did uh, disobey God. And they discovered, of course, it was misery. And so, isn't it wonderful that not only does Christ take away our sins, but the misery that sin has caused in our lives and that still is there and may be with us all our days, that Christ identifies with us in that and brings his comfort to bear upon us in that. And that will be true right through to death itself because death is the last enemy, as Scripture tells us. It's the last outworking in this life of the misery of sin. And none of us know uh, how painful our death may be. We do not know how prolonged it may be. We do not know whether it will be sudden uh, and without pain. But whichever it is, in Christ, when we believe in him, we have one who has compassion and who will give us all that we need to, as it were, complete that final step or stage of our journey on this earth. So tonight, to uh, these last verses, um, I was asked about these the first day I preached on them, um, and they are um, verses that puzzle us, It's verses 44 and verse 45, um, or verse 43, actually. Having cleansed the man, uh, Jesus uh, then said to him, he strictly warned him and sent him away at once or immediately. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But Allah, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every quarter. And you're probably asking the question, which everyone asks when they come to this passage, and which a minister should ask as well, what's the problem? What's the problem, Jesus? Or what's the problem, Uh, that this man um, creates, or we could ask it another way, what is wrong with what the man does? Well, um, the first thing to realize, or the overarching thing to realize, is this is the man's testimony. Notice the word Jesus used. He said, I want you to, to go to the priest and I want to show yourself to him, verse 44, as a testimony to him, the priest on duty, and then the other priests afterwards, they would hear about it when they came on duty. And why would they hear about the, or what would be so interesting and so exciting for them about the healing of a leper. Well, the Jewish teachers had a saying, and listen to the saying. Their saying was, it is easier to raise someone from the dead than to heal a leper. So no priest ever contemplated that he would see someone who had been healed by a priest uh, from his leprosy. And that is precisely 
what Jesus wants this man to do now. He wants him to go and to tell the priests in Jerusalem about the priest from heaven. The priest from heaven who has cleansed him from his leprosy and from his inward sin, something that you priests in Jerusalem have never been able to do throughout the years and the centuries of your ministry. So that's what Jesus wants him to do. So it's all about his witness. It's about his testimony. And so that tonight, this sermon is about our witness. It's about our testimony to others about what the priest in heaven, Christ, has done for us. And I want us to see two things from the passage tonight. It's really summed up under two headings. First of all, we have a neglected testimony. We have a testimony that this leper neglects that he fails to give and to bear. And that's one problem. That's one problem. Because there's people who should have heard about what the priest from heaven has done in the life of this man that the priests in Jerusalem could never do. And they're robbed of the opportunity to hear of that because of the man's disobedience. So notice Jesus' instruction to the cleansed leper. He strictly warned him. Now that is, uh, the words there are about as severe as you can get. Young people or boys, yeah, we've no, yes, we do have the two young boys with us. Boys and young people. It's like you've been summoned to the headmaster's or the headmistress's office. And you're made to sit there and the head or the principal of your school addresses you. They look at you straight in the eye and they say to you, here's what I want you to do. You now go and you apologize to the teacher that you have insulted and um, offended by your conduct or your action in the class. And it's that kind of language. Jesus looks at this man in the eye and he says, I'm telling you now, there is one thing that I want you to do and that I'm asking you to do. Indeed, I am commanding you to do. And I'm commanding you that you say nothing to anyone. That doesn't mean that he keeps his mouth shut forever. But it means there's an order of priority here. And I want you to go your way. Here's where you must begin. Like the people going back to the classroom and apologizing before the class to their teacher. He's saying, I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want to show you to show yourself to the priest. And then when you show yourself to the priest, you go through all that Old Testament ritual there in Leviticus chapter 14. And Jesus is saying, though I am the priest from heaven, I will, I can... Um, I will not break or set aside the law that I gave from heaven. I will at this time recognize those who have authority and leadership in the church. Yes, I am going to be the head of the church. I am going to be the savior of the church, but I'm not going to bypass those whom I've appointed to be leaders in the church. And I want you to go and to to do the things that I set down through Moses that we read this evening of in Leviticus chapter 14. And when the priest um, uh, looks at you outside 
And when the priest, you go through this ritual, the priest will have no other choice, but he will say, you are clean. You're cleansed. And then Jesus anticipates, you see, here's what happens. If um, someone who is a doctor or a nurse um, is treating a patient in hospital, and the patient is very, very ill, uh, they, let's say today, when they go off duty, and tomorrow they come in, and the patient's sitting up in bed, and they're talking, and they're completely and visibly well again, able to do all the things they couldn't do the day before. Well, is the doctor just going to say, well, that's very good. That's very nice. Well, they will be delighted, but they'll say, how did this happen? This doesn't happen. We didn't expect this to happen. We have never seen the like of this before. And sometimes that happens within, with Christians with illness. Somebody's diagnosed with um, cancer or some other illness, and they're undergoing various tests, and some months later they come back and there's another test done, and the doctor says, I cannot believe what I'm seeing here. I don't see any growth any longer. I don't see any swelling any longer. And, and uh, you are sitting there or the patient's sitting there and they are smiling inwardly to themselves and they humbly take the opportunity to say, well, doctor, um, my church has been praying for me. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the great physician. And yes, wonderfully, I appreciate all that you are doing as a doctor because you're an instrument in this hands. But this time, God has bypassed you and he has done directly what he normally would do through your skills and your abilities. So this priest is going to be asking, we've never seen the like of this. We've never heard the like of this before. How has this happened? And so the man, what's he going to do? He's going to tell the priests in Jerusalem about the priest from heaven who uh, healed him of his leprosy and declared him to be not only clean outwardly from his leprosy, but to be cleansed also from his sin. And we have to say, this is a neglected opportunity, a neglected testimony. And you see, the people who were most against Jesus were whom? It was the priests and the Pharisees and the priestly party, which was called the Sadducees. And so Jesus wants them to have the evidence also that the true priest from heaven is now among them on earth and that he is the one that the priests in Jerusalem need to look to for the cleansing of their sin. And so this man is commanded by Jesus, say nothing to anyone. Make for one place, Jerusalem. Now where's this happening? This is happening in Galilee. You remember our hand, the Holy Land? Galilee's up here. Samaria is the meat. If you think of a sandwich, Okay, the first piece of bread is Galilee, and then you've got Samaria, and the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans, so they walked around the Samaritan territory when they wanted to get to Jerusalem, down in Judea. So uh, Galilee, Samaria, Judea. That's the way the land was divided up. And Jesus is saying to this man, I want you to go from here, which is around Capernaum, up in Galilee, and I want you to travel the 60, 70 miles to Jerusalem. And I want you to tell the priests. What a mission. What a mission this man 
is given. To go to those who have leadership in the church, those whose eyes are blind and closed to Christ, and to show himself to them, to follow all that they have been uh, commanded by Christ to do at that stage in the history of the church, and then for those priests to say, how has this happened? What an opportunity. But it's an opportunity that this man neglects. Yes, it is cost. To walk 60, 70 miles is no small thing. And yet, they were used to walking in those days. And uh, people regularly would have made the journey from Galilee down to Jerusalem for the feasts. So it wasn't, Jesus never asks anyone to do what is impossible. He never asks us to do anything which, for which he doesn't give us strength. And so, brethren, the point comes to us this evening. And the question, I'll put it in the form of a question, is this. We have been healed by Christ from our sin. We are to bear testimony to Christ, the true priest. And there is a priority that Christ will give us in bearing testimony. And he will say to us, and he may well say to us, you say nothing to those out there, and you go to those over here. And that will tie in with our situations. It will tie in with those who have responsibility for us. So, let's say tonight somebody has converted, and some of you I know have been in this situation. They're converted, and they belong to a church that doesn't preach the gospel. Where are they to go to? They're to go to the priest, the minister of that church, and they are to bear testimony to that man or those men that lead that church, saying, here is what God has done for me in Jesus Christ. Because that man in leadership who does not believe those things, he needs to hear those things and he needs to believe those things and he needs to have the evidence of those things in your life and in my life. But also, is there not another aspect of testimony? Think of the person that is converted at 14 years of age. Where does their priority lie? Sometimes what happens in the church when somebody's converted at 14 years of age from a non-Christian family, there's great excitement in the local congregation. And so immediately the young person's asked to come, come forward to the front in the church service and, and talk about their faith. And then they're asked to somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere else. And what would our Savior say in these to those situations would he not say see that you say nothing to anyone in those contexts who are the people that have responsibility for you your parents and if they don't believe they need to see your faith in Christ the change that is made your teachers in school your peers in school those that you sit beside those that you, that you would consider your best friends, they are the people to whom you are to bear witness. But is this not the case, brethren? That is sometimes, we think, too difficult a witness to bear. Oh, I could never go to my minister in, in that church, and I could never sit down and tell him what God has done for me in Christ. Or young people might say, oh, I couldn't tell my, my friends. They would just say, they would laugh at me. They would say, oh, you've become a holy Jew. Or whatever other, or one of the, um, what is the phrase, holy rollers? Roller, uh, there was a phrase that our children had used to them at a stage. And, and, but you see, the point is that Jesus wants us to bear testimony to those who are in authority 
over us. Just like these religious leaders. If somebody's converted as an adult, the people that should hear and see first are a wife, a spouse, uh, fellow employees, a boss at work. That's not saying, I'm not saying that you go in and you get up in a soapbox on a Monday morning, but I'm saying they should be looking at you and saying, what happened to you over the weekend? You're a different person. Because that short temper or that foul language or that gossiping tongue already has been changed by Christ. So here we have a neglected testimony. And this passage teaches us tonight, brethren, and urges us, do not neglect the testimony that is ours. Ours. Don't neglect the testimony within our families. Don't neglect a testimony to our children. Don't neglect the testimony to our siblings. Don't neglect our testimony to our neighbours. And, and I'm not suggesting that we go badgering people or we go in a, the first words we say to our neighbour over the fence is, let me tell you what happened to me. Because often that person who speaks loudest lasts shortest period of time and is the shallowest confession of Christ. But I'm saying in the round of life, let people see that we have been with Jesus, changed by him. So let's ask ourselves, is there in my life tonight a neglected testimony? A neglected testimony that only I can give. But then let's see, secondly, an unhelpful testimony. An unhelpful testimony. Um, verse 45, but Allah, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter. And so that's what, he, that's what he does. He doesn't think Jerusalem, priests. He just thinks um, he's so, and there's some, uh, some senses I can understand this man. Imagine what he's been delivered from. Imagine what he's been rescued from. That isolation, being cut off from his family, brought back into his family, cut off from the church, brought back into the church, cut off from the community, brought back into the community. And you can imagine the excitement and the joy of this man at that. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is perfectly appropriate. But it's what he does with that is where the problem lies. Because now he goes and at, at, we would say he blubbers. That's at least I think that's still a Fermanagh word. He blubbers to everybody that he sees. It just means he, he's loose lipped. It just doesn't matter who it is. It just rolls off his tongue. It's a bit like the person, and um, again in the rural community, you'll appreciate this. Uh, my parents used to have, have a saying that if you told somebody something, you might as well have put it in the newspaper or put it in the, in the national newspaper because you can be sure it was going to be broadcast everywhere. And that's what this man does. He just goes out and he pays no attention to what Jesus has said and he allows his excitement and enthusiasm uh, to, to uh, uh, his, we could say, his heart to overrule his head so that he doesn't allow what he's heard to control what he's feeling and his joy and excitement. And so he goes out and he just spills it everywhere. Spills it everywhere. And it's a bit like the person, uh, young people in your school, there may be somebody who delights to just tell from one person to another, to another, to another, to another. And that's all they've got to talk about. Um, and they delight to be the one who knows and the one who tells. Well, you might say, well, what's wrong with that? And we might legitimately say, well, when it's the, when it's the good news of Christ, 
What's wrong with that? Well, look at what the rest of the verse says. We're given the reason why this part, uh, the unhelpful testimony, or why this testimony was in fact unhelpful. Look at the rest of the, the verse. See, here's the result. When this man went, as it were, blabbering it everywhere, Jesus could no longer openly enter the city. Why not? Were the leaders out after him? No. But was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every quarter. What's happening here? There's a number of things happening that uh, we only understand against the Old Testament background. And um, it is, well, this man's been healed. <coughs> and so, well, what are people going to come to Jesus for now? Every person that has got a sore big toe uh, or whatever is wrong with them, they're going to say, we've got a wonder worker. We've got a healer. And they're going to be interested in Jesus for his healing ministry alone. A bit like the crowd of 5,000 who were fed one day by Jesus with the bread and they came back next day. Why? Because they were going to get an easy meal. And Jesus said, you're not interested in the signs. You're not interested in what God is saying through these works that he's confirming that I'm his son and I'm the Messiah. You're only interested in the bread that will fill your stomach. And so there's going to be people now and they're going to flock to Jesus and they're going to crowd Jesus because they want to be healed from this physical illness or that physical condition or some other physical condition. That's one factor. There's also another factor at work here. And the other factor is that um, by this stage, the Old Testament church had lost sight of a Messiah who would change the heart. And their expectation was for a Messiah who would deal with the outward and who would drive out the Romans who were occupying their land, who were ruling over their people, who were, as it were, putting the heel upon the people. They were paying taxes to the Romans above all people. And so Messiah, when Messiah comes, he's going to liberate us. And you see, this is going to, this is going to create a, a, a hysteria amongst the people. Well, this must be Messiah, not Messiah who deals with my sin in my heart, but Messiah who deals with outward circumstances to improve your living situation as an individual, as a family, as a nation. And you see, that is an unhelpful testimony because it's a wrong testimony. Because first and foremost, what did Jesus come to do? We read it there uh, back in chapter 1, verse 7, 14, 38, 39, and the emphasis is on Jesus preaching. Look at verse 14. Um, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the miracles and the healings are simply the confirmation. This is God confirming, this is my son, listen to him. It's the, um, it's the proof that Jesus is who he said he was. Then verses 38 and 39, when they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. But Jesus said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may heal the lepers. Make the blind to see? No, that I may preach there also. You see, if the healings are sought for in and of themselves only, 
then the main purpose of Jesus' ministry has been lost. The preaching of the gospel. The preaching of sin by nature. Sin that takes men and women to hell unless Christ intervenes and unless Christ becomes their, the bearer of their sin and unless they know cleansing from sin in him. And so there was an unhelpful testimony. And the same is still happening today. Every church today that does not preach Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord, as the central truth, the unchanging truth, preaching week after week, whatever passage of Scripture has been dealt with, whatever book of Scripture, whatever era of Scripture, whatever individual from Scripture, showing how that brings us to Christ. If that's not happening, then the testimony of the church is an unhelpful testimony. So the testimony of the church for the early part of the 20th century, which was, well, Jesus was just a good man, a good example for you to follow. It was an unhelpful testimony. And do you know what it did? In Belfast, and in the cities in particular, it emptied churches. Because people quite rightly said, well, I know I need to be a better person. I know I need good examples to follow. And I know, and I'm happy to believe that Jesus is the best example, but I could spend my hour on a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening doing something, that, something else other than just being told what I already know. But what those people needed to know was the testimony that those churches were neglecting. That it, you cannot uh, be a better person. I cannot be a better person without the grace of God in Jesus Christ in my heart and in my life. And so today, let's apply it to our own personal lives as well. Let's be careful that our testimony to Christ is not the wrong testimony. It's not an unhelpful testimony. Let's, um, we have many blessings, many spin-offs, if you want to put it like this, from being Christians and belonging to this congregation. There's love. There's kindness. There's care for one another. There's fellowship. And... Um, but if you or I were to say, well, come along to our church and experience love. Come along to our church and the people will look after you materially. That would be an unhelpful testimony. We mustn't take our eyes off and take our witness from the central part, which is that Christ is Savior and Lord, and we must not do anything that damages the spread of the gospel by a wrong testimony. And that includes careless living. Living in a way which doesn't honor Christ. Being deceitful. Um, uh, being a gossip. Uh, being nasty to people. So that people can say, well, he says, she says, they're a Christian, and look at how they behave. That's an unhelpful testimony. So, brethren, as we leave the table tonight, we're thinking about this leper, and we're taking with us the fact that there was a neglected testimony, which is where he had to begin. And we're thinking about there was an unhelpful testimony, which hindered Jesus and... Uh, impacted the work of the gospel because it was a testimony uh, that had a wrong emphasis and gave a wrong emphasis to those listening. And so may the Lord help us in our witness to him to have a faithful testimony. 
Amen.